Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us really? today on this, well, somewhat rainy Saturday. So it's a great day to stay inside. So we're super excited to have you guys here today. My name is Julia. I am the Assistant Director of Parkinson Support and Wellness. And like I said, we're just super happy to have you. So good morning, everybody. It's really nice to have you. And we're very happy to have Lisa. And just like um, Julia just said, she was going to pass it on to me. I'm passing it on to Lisa. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for doing this, Lisa. You're welcome. Okay, everybody, I'm going to share my screen. We're going to go into a PowerPoint presentation, and I'll tell you who I am and what I do. Now, can everybody see that okay? All right, so this is the name of my company. It's called EmpowerWorks. I teach people how to take ownership of their life, their health, and their wealth, and I do that through education, design, and financial services. And it's not wanting to advance here. Hang on. Sorry about that. Let's see if I can go to this one. It works better. Well, it's not letting me do it. So will go this way. So this is my story. Um, I do have a bachelor's in design. I have a master's in architecture from UC. I was an instructor for the National Home Builders Association for maybe about eight years. I taught universal design and the certified aging in place uh, course. I'm a former educator at Miami and at UC. I, I'm a certified financial educator I'm also a fully licensed financial professional, and I'm considered a long-term care specialist. So I do both sides of this. I make sure that people have <clears throat> financial plans in place and have the proper long-term care insurance that they need in case something like this happens. And then I also have the design expertise to be able to design homes and modify homes, new houses, old houses alike. Um, that company is called Lisa Sandlin Design. I've been doing that for years. Um, going on, I let's see, 22 years now. Right now, I have a couple of projects going for families with children with cerebral palsy. I have a veteran that has ALS that I've designed a modification for their home. Um, I'm doing a special needs kitchen. Plus, I have several other just general projects. So I, I kind of am all over the place. The title of today is called Making a Home Accessible. But I'm going to tell you that we're not exactly going to do that. And uh, I'll explain that why throughout the process. Um, this is the uh, title of my book. It's called Houses That Work for Life. It's a guide to creating homes that provide security, comfort, and empowerment to all generations. This book is available on Amazon. I'm asking you not to buy it. It's dated. I wrote this book in 09. If you want a copy, contact me. Um, I think I can still get them much cheaper than what they charge like 30 some dollars for this book and it's ridiculous. But my mission statement is our home should support transgenerational interaction, not prohibited. They should be visitable for people of all abilities, whether we live modestly or in a luxury in a mass produced or custom built home, we all deserve to live and dwell in homes that empower us and enhance life's experiences. So what is universal design? I don't like titles. I just feel that universal design is good design. And when you look at things the way that I believe we should look at them, um, then it is going to be what I refer to as ethical design. And that is inherent to all the projects that I do. I incorporate sustainability and the universal design philosophy in everything that I do. In residential design, these are the typical um, options that we have. We have typical and standard design. We have visitable houses. There is accessible design, and I'll talk a little more about that. I'm going to go through each one of these. And then there's this concept called universal design. Every day we live and experience standard or typical residential design in almost every house in America. Where I get really crazy with this is even in some of our retirement 
facilities and in our patio homes, our aging in place facilities, <clears throat> I just don't feel that they have addressed things as well as they should have. So I'm pretty critical um, and you'll understand why as we go through. Here's a typical residential design. Um, some of the things we know we experience steps going in from all entry points. We have smaller garages, even a two car standard is a 20 by 20. We have 36 inch hallways, 36 inch wide staircases, and they're usually a straight run. And what I mean by that is there's no turns or landing points. And I still do staircases. I just make sure that we have at least one or two turns in them with, with landing spots um, for many different reasons that keeps uh, fall from going all the way down to the bottom. It gives us a place to rest going either up or down. So it just makes sense. Um, our door openings in a typical home, the widest door will be 32 inches. The bathrooms are typically seven foot by five foot. And even the larger ones, when you get into the big Homerama show homes, they're still inaccessible. Um, they have bathtubs and curb showers, which are absolutely, of course we need bathtubs, but we never need to have a curb on our shower. Um, their typical kitchen design is about getting more cabinets in the space. So they only do 36 inch passageways. And then we have inaccessible cabinetry and closets and storage in our homes. This is what visitable means. A visitable house provides one stepless entry into the house and it, it has a bathroom facility large enough for a wheelchair user to enter. There won't be grab bars, there won't be anything other than the wheelchair user can go in and out of the space. That's very minimum. Um, I'm gonna have a whole question uh, portion at the end of this. So if you guys have questions about anything, please jot them down since you're muted now. And we'll talk about all this at the end. So here's why I don't want to refer to this presentation as accessible. The American Disabilities Act are guidelines explicit to be met on all public buildings, but the ADA does not apply to residences. There are no codes for it. We do not have to meet it with a residence. So architects and designers don't even look at this unless they are already designing for a special needs situation. They don't even think about this. They go back to those standards and typicals and kind of the market and what's gonna sell. Um, so this act ensures that public buildings have an accessible bathroom and an accessible entry point, but these are extremely minimal compared to universal design. Over the 20 some years that I've been doing this, all the clients that I've worked with, I interview and I ask them about ADA and how they get around their town and when they travel and what happens in their life. And every one of them have shared with me that this is just not enough. There's just not enough help and assistance and ease of movement. So that brings us into universal design. And what the definition of this is, is the design of products and environments to be usable by all people to the greatest extent possible without adaptation or specialized design. So that's a mouthful. And when I teach this at the university level, most of the students look at me like I'm crazy. But there are actually seven principles of universal design that came out of the Center for Universal Design at North Carolina University. These are just bullet points. These descriptions go further and further. And if you wanna access that online, you can just Google the seven principles of universal design and you can read these in full detail. But what they are generally is equitable use. And that means that the design can be used by all people of all abilities. And we're not talking just physical abilities, we're talking cognitive abilities. We're not supposed to segregate or stigmatize with designs. So I'll give you some examples of what that means. Flexibility in use. It has to accommodate wide range of individual preferences and abilities. Think about different cultures. Think about different lifestyles. People are different sizes. People are different abilities. So this gets very, very complex. 
simple and intuitive use. It has to be easy to understand. That goes to the cognitive uh, discussion. It also goes to different cultures and different languages. Perceptive information, it has to communicate necessary information effectively to the user. Um, there has to be a tolerance for error. So we want to minimize hazards. How can we design to keep people as safe as possible? We want things to have low physical effort. So those of you on this call that are looking at and experiencing some physical difficulties, I have a mother that is 92. There's many doors that I go out in and out with her, including her own doctor's office, that she cannot operate because she is, doesn't have the strength anymore at her age to open the door. So we want things to have low physical effort. Size and space for approach is critical because we have to be able to accommodate someone in a wheelchair. We need to accommodate someone on a walker. We have, again, people of different sizes. We need to accommodate someone that maybe is able with assistance. So then we're looking at an approach for two people. So these are some of the things that I have studied for years and tried to look at and incorporate in my designs. This is the certified aging in place category. And, and this is what I taught for years. Um, this goes into three different categories when we're looking at this. We are designing CAPS uh, houses for those that have uh, no current needs at all. They just know that they want to have a house that will accommodate them well and empower them as they age. We have those with a diagnosed progressive need, and that would be something like Parkinson's, MS, LL, ALS, some of uh, diabetes kind of can go into that category. And then we have those that we're designing for that have an immediate need. That is due to a stroke or a severe illness, a car accident, where overnight someone was able-bodied and then instantly was not. So those are the difficult projects because it's very hard to get those done quickly enough um, to get them home from the hospital without them having to go to an intermediate uh, care facility. So when I say what is universal design, this is not it. Um, this is showing the example of separating or stigmatizing someone. This is not equity in use. This is requiring someone that is able-bodied to walk this ramp. But what else does this do? This also stigmatizes this home. This screams that someone with a disability lives here. So we don't ever want to advertise that. Now, in some situations, this is the only thing that we can do. And for um, that third category that I talked about with CAPS is to get somebody home, sometimes we have to put up a temporary ramp until we can make other modifications to get them in their house. But what I typically do is I'm designing for the long haul. When I'm designing a new house, I'm looking at entries and everything to be flexible. When I'm doing modifications, of course, those modifications are for the specific need of that user. This is a modification that I did on a typical ranch that had three steps going in. I raised the front porch level to make it even with the house. And then we landscaped a graded sidewalk. So this is the response in lieu of a ramp that you can do for a home. This, this family did not have any special needs. They were just aging and they, they assumed that someday that they would need to have an on-grade entry. They also were wanting to accommodate guests, people in their family that were already either on a walker or in a wheelchair. So when, we, when I look at design, I'm looking at use for everybody. And there's so many situations where as we age, our abilities diminish. Like my mother right now at the age of 92, she cannot do steps. She's still able-bodied. She's not a wheelchair user and she's not on a walker but it's very difficult for her to go in and out of a house that has steps. So this would be something that would accommodate even her with her minor uh, challenges. So in creating a house that works for life, I looked at every space in the home and I realized that everything in the house is developed around an activity or a task. And I'm gonna go through each one of the spaces, kind of bullet points and show you what 
what some of my criteria is. This is right out of my book, so um, I'm sharing with you some of the information in that. As we approach a house, we want to have a wide illuminated walkway with an even slip resistant surface. We want a step free accessible entry. That entry door needs to be a minimum of 36 inches. That is code, so that has to happen. We want to have an illuminated address sign and people are like, why is that so important? Well, I've interviewed a lot of, uh, of our um, paramedics and uh, first responders, and it's very difficult for them to see addresses on people's homes, and they don't know if they're going to the right house or not. So it's always a really good idea to have an illuminated address sign. You want to have an illuminated covered waiting area for your guests when they enter your home. You don't want them standing in the inclement weather, and you want them to feel safe. And you want to have an architectural emphasis that makes an impression. So you're going to hear me talk more about function than I do aesthetics. I believe that as a designer, things, yes, should be beautiful, but things have to work. If they don't work, then they're useless. So this is an example of a covered entry. It's illuminated. This is not on grade. There is a little step there. Um, I have real difficulty with my contractors getting them to actually read my drawings and um, do what I ask on the plans. And most often it doesn't get, it doesn't get built the way that, that I specify it to. This is an on-grade entry coming in from a beautiful covered porch. This is a home that I designed up in Holmes County built by the Amish. When we enter the inside of the house, we want the interior to have interesting architectural details because this is the first impression of our home. I think it's critical that we have coat storage nearby. We want to have easily maintained flooring, adjacency to public spaces, distance from private spaces. My homes all follow a public to private concept. And we don't want to access the bedroom areas, which includes the staircase. You will not see a staircase coming out of one of my public entry areas, because that has never made sense to me that we open up the door to the pizza delivery guy and there's the staircase going up to our most private rooms in our home. So I, I don't do that. This is a plan showing an example of the entryway. You come in the front door and I have the family room barricaded, basically blocked off. It's a beautiful entry right with, with glimpses into the other spaces but so many of my special needs families have asked me not to have the front door open visually into the great room space because they do not want their child on display. So um, I, again, this is part of the public to private concept that I use. And this is a glimpse of what that entry hall looks like when you come in, that's the front door that you're looking at. I've got little niches um, designed into the wall for uh, artwork displays and then you traverse back on through the house. This is another entry where you come in the front door and you don't see the entire living space, but you see light, you see out of the back of the home and you just get a glimpse of the living space, not full visual access. Our family entries. Now these are more important to me than the guest entry. This is where we come and go from our home. I think that they should have um, no level change they should have proximity to the kitchen because we're loading and unloading our groceries and this is where we, we live going in and out of this door. We wanna have a drop zone in that family area to eliminate the kitchen counter clutter because if we don't have a drop zone for the briefcases, bookcases, mail things, it all ends up on the kitchen counter. The pantry should be nearby because that's where the groceries are gonna go. We should have coat, shoe and boot storage for the family. We need to have a seat, some type of a window seat or other seating to take your shoes off and put your shoes on. I like to have a bathroom or at least a powder room adjacent to that. It should be a beautiful experience. When I come and go from my house, I do not want to come and go from my laundry room. I don't wanna see that I have that work to do. And that's typically um, how most traditional homes are designed. You come in from the garage in the laundry. Um, I don't do that. I provide a, a beautiful family entry. This is an example of having the garage floor come directly into the home without any step. You can do this. I do this even with homes in basement by modifying my foundation. I notch the foundation. I drop the floor joists down on the inside and then the concrete can come 
directly up to the floor level on the inside of the house. So this accommodates, we don't need a ramp, we don't need a lift, we don't need anything when or if uh, that is ever needed in the home. Our living areas, we need to have varied styles and sizes of seating. People don't realize that there's a lot of furniture out there today that, that older folks, people with any type of physical challenge cannot get in and out of. So you wanna have chairs and seating that can accommodate um, people with physical challenges. You also want to have appropriate surfaces for accessories and refreshments. People want to feel at home. You want to be able to use your space. You want to have ample space for required circulation and seating arrangements that consider multiple activities and users in the space. We want to have both natural and artificial lighting. And of course, in the, in the living space, a great room, there's usually a focal point consideration like a fireplace or the TV or a combination of both. This is an open living plan showing ample circulation, proper lighting, artificial. We have seating um, of different types and sizes to accommodate all users. Now we're gonna move into a universal kitchen. This is a kitchen um, that I did for a family. This family, I did their entire new home. It took me about a year to design it only because they kept, as they learned my design concepts, they kept adding asking for more and more. So this is probably the home that I've done in my, well, I, I just completed another one in Asheville, North Carolina that they, they did everything that I asked to. So this is one of my favorite projects, but here's some of, um, some of my details. We should have multiple height workstations in the kitchen. Most kitchens have one height countertop. I believe in multiple heights. I believe in a minimum of two working triangles for multiple users. We don't just have one person in the kitchen anymore. My passageways are a minimum of 48 inches. I have rounded or chamfered corners on all countertops. I hate sharp um, granite, any type of sharp corner in a kitchen. It's just a, it's terrible for children and it's tough on a, on a chair user. I always raise my dishwashers if I can talk my clients into it. And when I do, and I go back and do my post-occupancy evaluation, they inform me that that's the most favorite thing that I've done for them and their lower back. Um, I do microwave and wall ovens at a comfortable height for all users. I like work areas for the seated user. So I accommodate a, a chair user or just a, a person that just wants to sit down and peel apples. My dad used to come over every day to my house before he passed away. And he would help me do anything in the kitchen because I had a place right next to me that he could sit down. As I was across from him working standing, he was seated helping me in my kitchen. Um, you wanna have door handles, faucets, controls, and cabinet hardware that can be operated by arthritic hands. We want general overhead and under cabinet lighting as well as ambient lighting. I like a cart or an island on casters for flexibility. Even when I do a fixed island, I still like to have that cart. I'll explain that to you in a little bit. Accessible pullout amenities are offered now by most cabinet manufacturers. When I started this, they were not. Um, I do my sink cabinet. I put the drawer at the bottom so I can raise the, the the stuff that we put underneath the sink and make it easier to access. But I also then have a drawer at the bottom instead of a fake drawer at the top. Now, of course, for a chair user, that has to be changed out because that all needs to be open underneath. I do hidden and visible storage. That allows us for people with cognitive challenges to actually see where the food is, which is a clue that they need to eat because most often um, with some of my clients, uh, their appetite goes away and they need a visual clue that they, that it, they need to eat. Um, easily, easily maintained materials and um, a family message center, someplace where if you're not gonna have a home office, at least someplace where when you answer the phone, you got a place to take notes. That's kind of going away, but that was um, something that was much needed earlier on in my career. As far as where we eat, the dining spaces need to be adjacent to the food prep area. 36 inch minimum clearance around the table. Again, you want that alternate uh, style seating. You want interesting architectural details, former dishware and glassware display storage. A lot of people like to dis display those kinds of things. Varied levels of lighting. You want task and ambient, natural light and views for the outside. So this is the kitchen, um, the one that I told you that was the universal kitchen that I did. 
Um, this image shows the seated area of the cart. What in this kitchen do you guys think is unsafe for most users? And I know everybody's muted, so I'll just go ahead and tell you it's the microwave. When I specified this kitchen, I did not, will I ever specify a microwave over the cooktop? That is the most unsafe place that they can be, but it's where they typically are in most homes. And this family hired a kitchen designer after I did the general layout, and that's where she put the microwave. This is a picture of one of the raised dishwashers that I talked about, and this makes it very easy on your low back. And it just, I know the people that I've talked to, um, that have like vacation homes and stuff tell me that when they visit their other home and they don't have their raised dishwasher, they real, realize how much they appreciate the one that they have. Um, there again is the seated area for the workers. We have um, accessible height ovens and you can see where I typically put the microwave is in a wall unit. This is um, the cart that I was talking about. So you can see that the cart is on casters so this is actually my former kitchen from the home that I designed for myself. I no longer live there and these images are really hard for me, but um, the cart can be taken over to the oven and you can take out the turkey and put it on the cart and wheel it and carve it and then actually wheel it through this kitchen and take it to the table area. So if your strength begins to diminish, there's aids that you can have in the kitchen that actually help you. And I think a cart on casters like this I actually brought this cart with me to the home that I live in now. I wouldn't part with this cart for anything. Um, you want to have easy, operable hardware. So you want the levered hardware. I like the, the big top uh, faucets with the, the faucet that comes out with the sprayability. Um, these are the pull-out shelves that I was referring to that just make the lower cabinets so much easier to access. You can do this with drawers as well, but we do have this option if you don't want to have drawers all the way down. Um, I like the appliances to be easy to reach, not just the microwave and the wall oven, but also the refrigerator needs to be open wide. A lot of times I see side-by-sides or even refrigerators that are next to a wall and you can't open them up wide enough. So here's some images of that kitchen and how open it was with all the lighting, the passageways, um, everything in this kitchen just worked. There's the open storage that I talk about, which is my display of beautiful dishes for now, but in later years, it could be used for food. Um, this is a kitchen renovation that I did that was had the drop ceiling and it was a U-shaped, very tight kitchen. And I opened it all up, took out the wall between it and the family room. And in the corner here, if you can see on this image, there's not a raised dishwasher. These are actually dishwasher drawers. We still raise them, but if you want that option, you can do two drawers, one flanking each side of the sink, and you don't have to raise those because they're already at an easy accessible level. The bedroom should be adjacent to the laundry. That's why I don't like the laundry coming in from the, the garage. I like it near the bedrooms. It doesn't make any sense to me to load up my laundry and take it to the kitchen and then, or into the other opposite end of the house and then have to carry it all back. I understand that that, that was developed that way because um, that's where the woman was all day. So it made sense to gather up the laundry and take it and do it next to the kitchen and then at the end of the day, take it all back. But um, the bedroom should have at least a 36 inch door with um, that on the walk-in closets as well. Ample space for the bed and other furniture for circulation. You wanna consider built-in storage with window seats and shelving and possibly a desk uh, for just quiet writing or, or reading. Adjacent to the bathroom and dressing facilities, of course, is a must. This is just showing that a bedroom having some, some alternative seating and having ample circulation space for wheelchair usage, walker usage, assistant usage around the bed. This is the bathroom area. This is where it gets really critical. Um, you want to have a five foot floor space uh, diameter circle within the, the space, 36 inch minimum door opening that does not swing into the space. I prefer pocket doors. I will show you another uh, alternative to that. Um, the hardware consideration for pocket doors has to be looked at because it's really hard for arthritic hands to use the traditional ones. 
So I've developed some, some options there. The reason that we do not want the door to swing into the space is most often people get sick, they go into the bathroom and in a typical home, they walk in, shut the door behind them, and if they collapse in the floor, the paramedics cannot get the door open to get them out. Um, one of the first homes I did was for um, a police of a, or a chief of a, of a life squad unit, and he was the one that taught me that. So I make sure that if my bathrooms cannot have a pocket door, that we have ample space on the inside um, for circulation that, that they can get the, and I do a split door and I'll show you, I think I have an image of that. Easily maintained and slip resistant flooring surfaces. We want a shower with a 36 inch wide roll-in entry, no curb, cannot have a curb. You want a 48 by 48 clear space. Um, I used to do built-in seating. I don't do that anymore. I prefer the teak stools or the teak ones that can pull down off the wall. Um, after years of doing this and doing post-occupancy evaluations, um, most people prefer that over the built-in seat. Always, of course, skid-resistant flooring, uh, grab bars, adjustable slide mount, handheld shower head, soap and shampoo storage holders accessible from the seated position. You want a scald-proof faucet with levered styled controls. You want to have a bathtub in at least one bathroom with grab bars in a skid resistant surface. We want no protruding corners, especially around the tub area. I get a little crazy when I go into Homorama and I see these tubs with marble corners. And to me, that's just a huge fall hazard and um, place to crack your head open. Varied height vanities, again, 36 and 32 were different height people. Uh, seated users, you want to have a space for a seated user as well. Appropriate task lighting, uh, we need a lot more light as we age and ambient lighting. Accessible height toilet, uh, I use that in the master bath, a comfort height toilet in the powder room. And if I'm doing a wing for children, I will still do a standard or a lower toilet. Toilets can be changed out easily, but kids have a really hard time getting up on the accessible height toilets. I do seating in the bathroom other than the toilet for times where we need to sit down and clip our toenails or do whatever we need to do from the seated position. Um, it's not really safe to sit on the toilet. I, when I give a lecture for this, I'm usually doing the demonstration and I'm sure we've all had it happen where the toilet seat shifts. Um, safe storage for medicine, towels, linens, and accessories. And you might wanna to talk to your pharmacist about that. A lot of times now they do not want that stored in a humid area where uh, like a bathroom would be for your medicines. Um, adjacency to dressing areas, clothing storage and bedrooms. Sometimes the, the master closet, closet comes out of the bathroom. Uh, sometimes it does not. It just depends on what my client prefers. And then the guest bath should also have a discrete location and not just be wide open to the entry hall. I don't like that. but. Um, Personal care areas and varied vanity heights. Um, so this is a space for, um, this was a husband and wife. One was really tall, one was not. So I accommodate both and you can use whatever, but I do have an area for a seated user. And of course, then if, if there's a wheelchair user, they can roll up to the side and use that or we accommodate when that need arises. My showers always have um, an on, you know, never a curb. That's one that has the built-in seating. We do grab bars. This person was not physically challenged in any way, but she just wanted a really big shower. So this one was great. I've got um, the, the shampoo stuff in this bathroom is too high. It should be down. So if you're seated, you can access it. This is the, the uh, split style French door that I was talking about. If you can't accommodate a pocket door, then you wanna do this type of a door because at least the paramets can get one side open. And you can see that this bathroom is large enough that um, they, if they had gone in and in front of the vanity, they're not gonna be in front of the door. This is a small bathroom that had some closet areas and it was just a powder room and I converted it into a master bath with a large shower. That shower is actually five by seven. So um, I, here's an image of what that turned out like. Um, so you can take even some small spaces and open them up with proper planning if you borrow from closets and things like that, which I did in this one. 
This is my mom's bathroom and the one on the left is what it used to be. This was a, a retirement uh, community, 55 and over, and why they ever designed it with this tiny little bathroom and then this big vanity out in the secondary space. My mom literally had 18 inches um, from the uh, around her toilet from the vanity over to the shower. The shower door was 22 inches. It had it was a glass door sliding that was totally inaccessible, unable to clean in any way, shape, or form. It had a big, nice deep linen closet in there, but it also had a swing in door. I don't have the doors drawn on there, but this is what I converted it to. So I shortened the closet. I have it completely accessible. This built this home was on a slab, so I rotated the toilet from its existing spot. I extended the shower, still have a really nice big vanity in there, but I moved everything down, got the corner, uh, uh, the, the turnaround. The diagonal in the corner is a shelving unit that actually has a grab bar on the front of it. My stepfather fell and broke his hip nine months ago. All of his rehab was done in this house. The occupational therapist, the physical therapist, the nurses that came there were just astounded at this bathroom because they said nobody ever has this. And uh, my mom's been living like this ever since she moved in the house because we modified her bathroom. The left, the far left is what it looked like prior. There's her handheld shower and controls that she has now. That's the pocket door, a good 36 inch wide pocket door going into the space. And I did the extension of the glass block shower. This shower does not have a door. My mom prefers to have a shower curtain. So she has a shower curtain. Here's another bathroom that I did um, in the house that I showed you the entryway on that I accommodated the, the, for the, the porch. Um, this is a large bathroom now that is fully accessible with roll under seating, um, curbless shower, storage, everything that they need. So a laundry room should have a counter space for folding and flat drying. We should have a five foot clearance again. We need soiled clothes storage, a sink, hanging clothes rack, an ironing station, and if preferred, the raised front load or energy efficient appliances. That's, that's totally a personal preference on that. I have clients that hate their front loaders and I have clients that love their front loaders. So again, that's a personal preference. Here's some of the houses. This is just a brief portfolio of what I've done. This is an aging in place home. Um, it, do, it is multiple floors, but I do have a, a core. When I'm designing a multiple floored home, I always stack closets and I do a core already built in, easily modified if we need to install a home elevator. But this is the interior of that house um, coming in off of that covered porch, everything open. Uh, the staircase does have two landings going down to the lower level. And again, they have an option for an elevator if needed. This is gonna be really hard for you guys to see, but this, is, this was a, a home that I had a family, they purchased it without my um, approval. And then I had to go in and convert this. This family had a child that um, due to vaccines, uh, she became uh, quadriplegic um, as a baby at nine, mon nine months old. So. She lived to, um, she was about nine years old when I got this project. And this was the first time that they had been awarded the funding uh, from the lawsuit. So we were able to modify and give her a wonderful bathroom suite facility. I do ceiling lifts and everything in there that opened the kitchen up, converted the back part of the house into a big great room and open space. Um, this was the kitchen before, and that was the kitchen after and how we opened it up. This is the home that I showed you already. Um, this is the interior of that home. She had a very small room. She had several small rooms in this ranch. I blew out the whole load bearing wall in the center of the house, recessed the beam up into the ceiling and opened it up and turned it into a great room. This is an aging in place project that I did where we actually did an addition on the front of an old salt box styled um, passive solar home. So it didn't have any light on this side of the house. I was able to add this great room. I tied it in with the existing garage. So they now have a covered entry into their house. You walk in into this incredible 
space that does accommodate her laundry, but this is also right next to the master bedroom suite that we built onto the home, which is what that looks like. And then this is her bathroom. So she has an accessible uh, bathroom as well. These are just some other projects that I did. This was for a, a house, a lady that was aging in place and she needed a design. She's an artist, she wanted a studio and we converted her bathroom from the typical into an accessible. So things happen in life changes. You guys are more aware of that than most. This can be sudden change or it can happen over time, but it will happen. When we follow a universal or inclusive design philosophy from the beginning in our new homes or in our home renovations, it just makes the most sense within the demographics of today's society. So with that, I will open it up to questions and I will stop sharing so people can ask me whatever they wanna ask. So we got a question. Oh, I'm still, I didn't realize my video was off. We got a question from one of the participants. Um, medicines in the bathroom, warm, humid, not ventilated. So here, I will put that in the chat. Right, that's what I was saying going through there. Um, a, lot of, a lot of doctors and pharmacists, so I said, talk to your pharmacy as to whether you should store your medications in the bathroom or not. Okay. Um, we do, we accommodate, um, so there's situations where people want to stay in their home and the children actually contact me. And so there's some security devices and things that we can do now that we can actually monitor when they open their medicine cabinets to see if they take their medicines or not during the day. So it allows them more independence, but still with some caregiving from afar. So in situations like that, I'm not sure about the humidity and how, how all that's going to work. I just wanted to mention that. You're right, the medicines, a lot of medicines should not be stored in the bathroom. Anything else? Can you unmute? Did you unmute everybody, Julia? I, I asked everyone to unmute. I'm okay. just going to. You can just ask me questions. You don't have to type things in the chat. Okay, so. May I speak? I'm going to start with you, yeah. I have a question. Go ahead. Okay. So electrical outlets, and these are somewhere down there. Usually in my home, I like to search for whether they are behind a cabinet or they're under a bedroom or whatever. And I was wondering whether it makes more sense for the outlets to be maybe at a height of a sitting down height where I can kind of just extend my arm, and that's where the plug should be, I suppose. Yes. I don't know. Why should I be bending down? And <laughs> I can bend down. The problem is getting up, always. <laughs> well, that's <laughs> that we teach in the CAPS program is where the electrical outlet should be. And they always say that they should be raised. Typically, they're um, about 18 inches off the floor on the top edge of the outlet. Uh, some people raise them up to 24. When in a kitchen, most often uh, around an island and things like that, you wanna have them higher and at the accessible height. I do, I have done outlets on the front of uh, cabinets before where, where we need things, but we also need them behind for our appliances. So that gets a little tricky, but yeah, electrical outlets, uh, the, the switches on the wall can be lowered um, and in an accessible situation, we most often do that. What I have found in, in a universal situation is people don't like that look and the aesthetic still comes in. So again, it's a personal preference, uh, but in the CAPS course, we do teach uh, the guidelines where the outlets are raised and the switches are lowered. Hmm. So you're right on, you're, it's all, it's, it's, taken care of. It's just really, really difficult to get builders to do this in standard homes. We just can't get them to change. It's more a question of form over function, isn't it? Because, oh, I'm sorry, I'm moving around a lot. You're fine. Uh, but, um, I mean, the function should, should probably come from the user. So while the house might not be resellable from that point of view, if it's functional to me, 
I am more probably going to live a little longer and uh, be happier. I think. Would I? So, so I will share with you my frustration, and it's been I've been doing this now for twenty years. I mean, I. I enrolled in the University of, of, U, of UC. I went to UC in 1992 to design a better home. My father was a builder and I felt like we just are not designing good homes. And so I have been on a mission since 1992 to change the way things are. I've taught at every level and I have hit objections at every level. If I don't do a special needs situation, I cannot get my builders to accommodate what I'm asking them to do. So in even those situations, I still run into hard times with it. Um, it's just people are reluctant to change and people are looking at that resale value. Now, I have had clients that they don't care about the resale value. This is their home. They're going to live in until they die <laughs> and they want it the way that they want it. Then we're good. Um, so it's, it's been extremely frustrating for me because I feel that, that all the things that I talk about would empower everybody in their lives. And, and I show examples of that. It's not about having an illness or being in a wheelchair, you know, wider hallways or my dad even said to me, he said, Lisa, he goes, you're never going to get people to pay the money for a wider hallway. I said, then we need to design houses without hallways. Yes. There you and, go. You know, I mean, <laughs> we have to think outside of the box. And I can't get other designers or builders to actually do that. I was on a real heavy mission with this right out of college and then making some headway. And then we had the housing crash in 07 and 08. And mm. things, and it kind of went back to where nobody's looking at this. And it's even in our retirement homes, we have a very high end retirement village here in my town. Not once have they consulted with me and every home in there is not accessible. Mm. And apartments that they put these people in are not accessible. I go into retirement communities like, you know, just retirement homes where they have assisted living and they have um, mm -hmm. independent living and they have nursing care and they still aren't doing what they should be doing. It's just very, very frustrating for me. Um, may I continue? Or other people, if you have any questions? Julia, should yeah, I? Yeah, feel free, yeah. Okay, feel free. Oh boy, okay, so is it a code kind of restriction that uh, builders face because they have to kind of keep their um, licenses, I suppose, and that kind of stuff. And they, they might get into some kind of a heavy water with the local governance or something like that. Is that why builders are not very happy at doing any modifications like this? Or yeah, is there okay. a special okay. place yeah. where we can kind of apply saying, hey, look, I cannot even stand up. So I want all those things at this level or whatever. I'm just making this up, but yeah. Well, the problem is if we don't have codes addressing this, you know, everybody thinks ADA applies to housing. It does not. Um, there are some communities now um, across the country that the minimum requirement is at least a visitable home. Um, but in most communities, the codes as an international code, housing does not address any type of accessibility or universal design. So in my local community, I'm on the planning commission. I am trying to get things changed. I don't know how to do it other than from a grassroots level and just try to do it myself. But builders follow codes. Um, designers, they follow the drawing. Most designers do not design the way that I design. When I show them how to do it, they're like, oh, yeah. But uh, most often when they're bidding it, they're not looking at the details. They're just bidding it to be a typical house that they always build. So. Are you local, Lisa? I'm in Hamilton, Ohio. So I don't know where everybody is, but yeah, I'm, I'm just north of Cincinnati. But I, I, I'm all over you guys. I've done projects. I've got one in Bowling Green right now. I've gone to Michigan. I've gone to North Carolina. Um, I get pulled in all over because I'm unique. Lisa, uh, yeah. where do you, 
Lisa? Yes. Uh, where are you located again? I'm in Hamilton, Ohio. Oh. Just okay. north of Cincinnati. I live at Bethany right off 675. Yeah. I know right where you're at. Right. And uh, there are several violations in my cottage, believe me, including sliding glass doors in the master bath. Um, that has to be a real, that's, that's a terrible, um, just a disaster waiting to happen. So fortunately, I hope it'll never happen. Uh, but my place has no hallways. It's a, um, a cottage, um, but it has three bedrooms and two baths. So um, plus a, a sunroom, um, a pretty good kitchen for accessibility. So um, I, I have some of the things that you've mentioned throughout that are, that are really important for people. The one thing I had in the house that I sold though, that as a, since I'm uh, vertically challenged, let's say I'm five feet tall, uh, I had the builder put in a cooking area where I would do my baking and knead bread and make things at my height. That was the best thing I ever did. There you go. That's that multiple height workstation that I talk about. Yes. Best thing I ever did. So, and we had levers on the doors. We did a little bit of that. We didn't, get, but when we redid our master bathroom, we took out the regular standard, um, you know, shower tub combination. That's all one piece and you take it out and that's the end of it, you know, and had them tile the side walls, uh, clear up almost to the ceiling and tile the uh, floor and put a no barrier shower in. And that's that was an amazing thing for my husband when he had Parkinson's and uh, he could no longer, you know, have gotten into a tub and that sort of thing. Yeah. Rose, did they do blocking for grab bars? Did you have grab bars in there? Oh yes. I in fact the the fellow who did the shower, <clears throat> he asked me about where, you know, so I was sort of doing it from looking at his height and my height. And then my husband was six feet tall. So um, <laughs> there, there you go. Um, it, we put in two or three grab bars. So I always do grab bars. And I had a client who, who she had no physical challenges and they really didn't care about aging in place. And I said that we were going to do block. I do blocking everywhere in the bathroom. So when, when the situation arises, the occupational therapist or physical therapist come in and they say where the grab bars go. I don't say yes. that. I make sure that I've got general blocking everywhere. But, but I still do one grab bar in the shower regardless. And she told me she didn't want a grab bar. And I said, well, wouldn't you feel safer like holding on to a grab bar when you wash the bottom of your feet? And she said, I don't wash the bottom of my feet. I was like, oh, okay. that's how the <laughs> get with me it's like <laughs> trying what do you to say to that <laughs> I just funny. like well okay then moved on <laughs> cool that I tell people what I think they should do three times in various ways I will try to educate them three times if they're still obstinate about it <laughs> then I just <laughs> I give up okay hey, um Lisa, I have a question regarding all those things that you said about variable heights and uh, spaces. And uh, the two things which came to my mind. One thing is, uh, uh, would it, uh, I don't know, whether there is a possibility that the heights could be adjustable from the point of view of uh, comfort to individual users. Or if, if I have a shorter, uh, you know, from my hip to my head, shorter kind of uh, torso, I'm stuck with a shorter torso because all those other designs will maintain normal ratios and <laughs> what do I have to do? So I'm wondering whether adjustability kind of thing or is it more uh, European <laughs> Norwegian kind of concept or is it something that also <laughs> have, builders have a problem with that? And the second question, I just pose it here and then we draw. Okay. 
is uh, the smart homes, so electrical connections and things like that. I was an electrical engineer. So naturally, thing is, is there any smartness that we can bring about from the point of view of me having to reach that uh, button? I may not have to reach that um, uh, electrical socket, uh, socket button, button, socket, yes, but not the button for me to adjust the lights, change the uh, wattages of the light actually. Uh, things like that. So, is there any perspective now that uh, the the designer, in fact, a uh, universal uh, accessibility yeah. designer, like you? Yeah, so thank technology you. Technology is changing everything every day. So, I used to be a real stickler about how we were going to access upper cabinetry. Um, I taught at UC for 10 years and my brother's an industrial design professor there. We've had students design cabinets that come down with a, a pole that you can pull things down. But with the design now of wheelchairs and what the wheelchairs can do, I have clients that are wheelchair users that can reach higher than I can because their chairs go up higher than I can. Um, so technology is changing everything. We do have pneumatic sinks that can raise and lower in the kitchen now that have the, they're designed so you, they're accessible underneath. The problem is, is we can do all of that with the proper budget. In most situations, I do not have clients that have any money. Um, these families with children with cerebral palsy, mm -hmm. there has not been a lawsuit that they have won they most often have no money for any modifications. Mm -hmm. um, as we're aging, if we don't have long-term care insurance, you know, Medicare does not pay for any of this stuff. So mm -hmm. if we don't have the proper financial planning, which is why I do that as well, I did that way before I got into this field. So I've just combined it, combined it all. Okay. But yeah. the proper long-term care protection is an indemnity plan. And that's, that's what I market. It's a plan that will pay you cash and you're not doing a reimbursement or anything. So it will give you money to make these modifications in your home. But as far as the technology that's out there, there's all kinds of stuff that can move up and down and chairs that move up and down. And, and we have that kind of stuff. It just all costs money and most people don't have the money. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Does anyone have any additional questions? It's a little past noon. Um, just we want to respect everyone's time because our program is running from 11 to noon today. So any other additional questions for Lisa? Lisa, this has been very helpful. Thank you. Thank it you. Has. It has. Very, very, very enlightening. Yeah. Very insightful. Yes. And if yeah. you guys, I got my number. I've got my email in the chat. Please feel free to reach out to me. I, I will help you in any way that I possibly can. And I, I do a lot of consultations for free. So just call me. Thank, Thank you. you, Lisa. Thank, Thank you, you so much.